Hi everybody, it's John Jay, April 20th. Thanks for joining. I wasn't trying to make it exactly seven o'clock. I usually do, but I got wrapped up in trying to get some things done. So um, thanks for joining. Uh, today, I just wanted to talk about um, what's gonna be more of a continuation on um, private property and how we could secure a lien on it and the reasons why. But I wanted to share a couple of stories with you um, that I've experienced this week with clients. Um, so ultimately what we're gonna talk about is um, how your identifying information is being collected, who's doing it, what are you gonna do about it, why you wanna do something about it, okay? Um, and I, I made notes here, but it looks like more like a story. So I'm gonna use this as a prompt here. And then we'll, we'll certainly do some uh, questions and answers, um, but let me just get into it here. So this last week, um, somebody was, I was working with somebody who, um, just let me preface this whole thing by explaining. Um, I know this question is going to come up, but intellectual property rights are well known, just like the Motion Picture Association of America is very, I mean, th that organization has lobbied Congress to make sure there are criminal penalties and they will aggressively, that organization will aggressively uh, penalize anyone who uh, makes illegal copies of movies. And these rights are held by other owners of intellectual property. It just seems like though, that the Motion Picture Association of America is more diligent about enforcing those rights. So um, the property rights I'm talking about here, uh, in th these are intangible private property rights. They have the same legal significance, understanding, presence. I mean, everyone understands what this is. The law recognizes them. And I'll give you another example of what that might be. So we might talk about, we might talk about biometric data as one example. Biographical data is another example, something that would identify an individual human being that has these rights in the first place. But we can also talk about if I have copyrights to a poem I wrote, okay, those are similar, they're identical actually. Um, but also what about medical privacy rights? These are intangible private property rights and you could impose a lien on those rights. So it's just something to think about, okay? The right to inform consent, things of that nature. But um, the analogy here is intellectual property rights. And um, let me just start by talking about, so there was, a, there was a gentleman I helped and he had he had conveyed the title to his house to an LLC and he had um, property tax exemption. Now in some states, they only recognize the property tax exemption um, if it's held in a person's name. Just give me one second here. Let me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to, uh, Right, here we go. Right. So, so in Florida, I don't believe that the state recognizes um, a homestead exemption if the title is held by a company or a trust, even if the beneficial interests are still that individual person or a couple, the married couple that had the title. So in this case, in, he was in South Carolina, he conveyed the rights <clears throat> and the property of the title and the, the tax assessor, assessor had seen the record because it's part of the same system and assessed him a tax without the exemption. And so it was a lot more money. It's like five times more money, I think. And so he, he called me about it. And, and really the, um, the, the property uh, tax appraiser, the assessor's office was actually pr quite friendly and accommodating. And when, when he called him on the phone, he didn't really know what to say. So it was kind of a awkward, but when I uh, got involved and I wrote a letter and then it, it got over to them by email and they were really quick to give the exact documents that were needed, the information that was being requested in order to establish three things. So in order to keep the property tax exemption, he had to still, he had to show that the, the, even though the ownership changed by title, that he retained the beneficial interest. And the reason why he, the way he was able to do that is because he just happened to be the single member owner of the LLC. And so it was easier to, it was easier in his case to do it that way. Um, so just showing a copy of the articles was enough. Okay, the articles that were filed with the state showing that he was the sole owner of the LLC, All right? And then also that he was still a resident, that's easily done with a voter card, or in his case, he was okay with using a driver's license. And then the other uh, aspect of this was that he still lived there. And then we just used the utility bill. And so that should be enough to establish that, right? Well, then the, the state wanted disclosure of his tax returns. So it was very easy to disclose all these other things. These were understood. But when it comes to the tax returns, we have a problem with that because Disclosing federal tax returns to any third party um, is a waiver, it may constitute a waiver. And you actually have privacy rights, believe it or not, in the tax code. Not many people know this, but in Title 26 of the United States Code, in Section 6103, 
you can look this up. I mean, you guys can see on my screen right here, right? You can look this up and you'll see in there that you actually have privacy rights. So um, by if you look at the conditions where privacy rights are waived, disclosing your tax returns to another government agency may constitute waiver, right? And this may lead to all other weird kind of situations, awkward situations, um, detrimental situations. It may cost him money later on. And unless there is some stipulation that uh, he's going to be indemnified for any adverse consequences that weren't you know, anticipated or that could happen, right? Which the state's not going to do that. Um, or they're going to say that um, it doesn't constitute waiver, right? So I don't think that's going to happen either. So the question we had back to them was, um, what is it that you need? What is the purpose? And you have every right to ask. There's actually a law for this. You have every right to ask what the purpose is that the information is going to be used for and, you know, what, what you can do with it, right? <clears throat> and so my thinking was the information on the driver's license is the same as what's on the tax return. All they want to do is show, yes, indeed, sure, he's still claiming that he's at this address and that's his name on the tax return because it's under penalty of perjury and the driver's license would show the identical information. So why do I need redundant information? I mean, it's an official public record, right? It's a government record. And so we're, we're in the middle of doing that right now, but I think they're working with him and I think it's going to work out just fine. But I'm just saying, this is a point, this is why I like to I do these things and talk about this because there are there, there's a lot more to it than just, ah, it's just a couple of documents. I'm going to give it to him. Well, you don't realize just like you probably never heard of 6103 in the tax code, right? You never knew that you had privacy rights in the tax code. So I know things like that. Um, and, and this is what this is why I'm talking about this. So he, he conveyed his home, the, the tax was assessed. Um, there was a delay in him responding. So what we need to do is establish these, these three facts, right? So I have them underlined in here, which I were to talk about that. So um, we didn't ha have a need or we don't know what, what else is needed here. So even if you, you're not sure of all the legal aspects of it. You always want to ask what the purpose is and what is your normal policy for the use of this information, for the collection, storage, and use of this information, okay? What is your purpose? And if you if the purpose is not adequate or you feel like uh, the, it's placing you in some sort of jeopardy and you still need to disclose it, you can do, you can do a couple of things. You can redact some of the information. If you, once you find out what is being what was being uh, the purpose of the information, right? Maybe maybe the tax return, the financial information may not be necessary to establish residency, but the fact that he testified on his tax return about his residential address that might be enough. Well, he already did that on the driver's license, so why do I need to you know give you the duplicate information, right? I can't imagine why they need the financial information. Uh, but anyways. Um, so there's there's that that's going on, and and so that would be the reason. Okay, I don't want I don't want my disclosure to constitute waiver, and at the same time, if I'm going to disclose this, I I really do want to know um, what your data retention policy is. Most people don't use that term though; they use like a privacy policy statement or something like that. But if you don't like it, you can modify the terms as to, and condition the disclosure upon those terms. You can you can change it. You can tell them, okay, I'm going to disclose it, but uh, I want proof that you've destroyed it or that you're only going to use it for that purpose and no other purpose, you know, things of that nature. We'll get into that. Now, a, a, a nice, clean way to do all these things, to to, inter, to interact with these agencies and third parties is this, this lien that I'm going to talk about, okay, that I've been talking about. It's very non-confrontational. It gives you the power, the, the upper hand. No one can do it ahead of you. No one can take that property away you're the only one that can put that lien on there and if you don't put the lien on there well the property's still there it's just considered abandoned in some cases right so another one um what was it so okay so this this woman she was um so she was wanting to uh, she had a contract and she was she had it was a buyout clause and a, and a contract and so she was a member of a limited liability company as a as a as a part of the buyout two-year buyout agreement, right? So it took two years to buy her out. And she was thinking that it looked like they had, this organization had uh, received more money during a period of time. And therefore she was eligible for receiving more money and she didn't get her share is what she uh, is, is talking about. So when she was trying to get the information on the finances, the financial statements, she had, uh, she had a, an entitlement to uh, financial disclosures, but she was asking for a little bit more than was in the written agreement, which I don't see a problem with that. But um, whoever was responsible for those records told her that um, she couldn't get those records because 
they were proprietary. Now, proprietary is a very special term, and this is why I want to introduce you to this concept. Proprietary data in a corporation is some type of information or records that are a, a special to the company and that are intrinsically value, valuable. They, they are, they're what the company relies upon to produce money or have certain types of value, right? And if those records aren't kept in a certain way, like labeled as proprietary data, or they're not kept in a secure location or under a, um, let's say in a safe, right? Or, or some way that treats them differently than my, uh, you know, my discard pile near the trash can, right? Uh, then it's not really, my, my claim of proprietary data is not gonna survive. But these guys were just acting in bad faith, right? Whoever it was. And I said, well, if it's, if it's proprietary data, you already have a, an interest in the arrangement and it's not disclosing the proprietary data, if it is, to a non-party or a third party. But even if it were, all the company would have to do is give you a non-disclosure agreement to sign and create a liability, you know, some sort of penalty if you, uh, if you disclose this information. And it wasn't like it was a trade secret either. So anyways, they were just acting in bad faith. So this is what I'm saying. Um, what was it? They, yeah, so they could have just simply, um, they could have simply uh, disclosed it in that case. So I just want to make that little short point uh, because um, she had a she had a reasonable uh, property right there, and so there's a, there's a process that she can follow. But anyways, so the property tax case we're still waiting for a response. Either way, uh, there is always a good reason to limit the disclosure of information. Now I know even myself included, I've disclosed information or allowed it to be disclosed or captured, if you will, um, uh, and we can clean that mess up, right? We can clean it up with a lien, all right? Yes, I'll, I'll publish it. I'll put this document in um, in the Telegram group. And if you guys want me to email it, certainly I can email it to you. And I'll, I left it here so I can make some uh, modifications. So we'll see if I need to if I need to do that. So, um, And then, yeah, so just be aware of when someone's asking you for information. Like, for example, if a driver's license purely is, is the, um, okay, okay, time. If a driver's license, a license is the payment of a tax for the privilege of doing something that would otherwise be unlawful, then why do I need to include my photograph with that? And why does it become part of an immutable permanent record forever, even after I die? I mean, paying a tax should be sufficient, right? Well, then all I need is the receipt to show I paid the tax. So whoever holds the receipt has the license. No, they don't want to do it that way, right? This whole system, as you're aware. So there's conditions on disclosing your information. Uh, so when anyone, especially government agency, asks you for your personal privacy, financial tax, or yeah, private information, financial information, tax credit, or banking information, that's mostly what we're dealing with, right? I, I like to say also personal identifying information. Uh, you have a right to know the purpose uh, for the request, um, how it's going to be stored, how it's going to be used, right? And ultimately, how it's going to be destroyed. Now, I know I, I've been talking about this for about a month now. <clears throat> if you want me to help you, I will do this. I have a new order form. I will, I'm charging a fee to do this service, but I'm also doing these videos and I want you to be empowered and, and want to do it yourself. But I will help you if you want me to. I will help you prepare a security agreement that you can put place on the public records. And what it's going to look like is once I show you how to do it once, I'll help you do more if you want. But once you see how it works, you can, you can continually do that from a long list of uh, third parties that are collecting your information. And then you can start controlling how the information if it's going to be allowed to be used and then how or in what manner it's gonna be used because you're gonna be able to create a liability on the accounting records of these organizations. Let's just pick Google, for example. Let's just go after them, you know, Google. Now, yeah, you may suffer, um, if you wanna call it that, the, uh, the closing of your account in some cases. Now, I'm not sure if that's even legal. I'm just thinking maybe that's a good thing, but Time will tell, right? I'm sure there's a remedy and there's things that we can work on, but it's it's going to be quite interesting to see as we start filing these, what's going to happen. I've not been yet involved in filing one. I'm about to file mine. Anybody who wants to do it, let me know. I'll help you. Um, yeah. So, and here, that's what we're going to discuss. So, what I want to show you guys, and I'm going to break for just a minute here and see if we have any questions that I can address that are related to this, if you don't mind. And then um, I'm going to bring in some other exhibits. Just let me know uh, so I have any raised hands here anywhere. I got a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so once you put it in public record, like I have put mechanic liens on houses, and people who owe me money. Yes. Do you do you just inform Google or do you just inform whoever that you have a lien on your biometric data 
and if they um, if they uh, if they violate if they violate that 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 lien that they could be sued yeah you can tell them that but you don't have to because it's public record and they will find it however i'm going to show you right now how you would do that all right good question okay and then on the cbdc yeah did you did you guys hear the commentary from uh governor DeSantis here in florida on, on the cbdc well he, he just went off on him and talking about how all the different variations of evilness that it is the governor of florida did that and he said we're we're running a law now to to prevent the anywhere in the state of florida that currency being recognized they will not let merchants require the central bank digital currency and he's encouraging other states to do the same including texas which i think they're going to do that too so yeah he's modifying our uniform commercial code here in florida to to eliminate the possibility that the banks will be able to impose that on the people that live here in florida okay so okay. If, we're in, if we're in a different state and because i'm in a very 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 liberal state i'm assuming they're going to go ahead and go through with that probably can yeah. Can I file a lawsuit against the governor? No, but what I was going to tell you is that to answer the question, this security agreement can totally slam the CBDC. It, re it requires your biometric data. We can totally slam it with this agreement. Okay, so are you going to share the process on how how we are able to do that. Yes. <laughs> so let's just do that right now. Any, any other questions? All right, good. So I don't see any more. Sorry if I miss anybody else. Okay, I think we're good. All right, so let me go into this. Um, I'm gonna do another screen share. Uh, and then this one, I'm gonna put it up on my computer. Oh, got so many things. All right, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Okay. Gotta do that. Okay, so we're going to go right to one of the biggest perpetrators. This is going to be LexisNexis. Let me do a share screen. Here we go. All right. So here's LexisNexis. LexisNexis um, is a credit reporting agency. Okay, it's not it's not one that we talk about. But it is the one, the uh, the one that, that is able to validate and verify your uh, disputes. So that's why you can't get your disputes accepted, because when you dispute an item on your credit, all that Equifax does is go to its echo chamber, LexisNexis, and LexisNexis says, "Uh huh, we have that item, it's valid." And then Equifax comes back and says, "It was validated." And then we don't know what to do, right? So there, there's a whole game there that we can talk about if you wanted to, but I'm not going to talk about that today. What I want to show you is that the biggest perpetrators of the collection of your private identifying information is going to be LexisNexis, okay? And, and then another one I'm going to get to in just a second here, but, but here's what you do. Once you have the lien filed against, let's say, LexisNexis, and, and one thing I like to do is we'll file the lien and make sure we get the exact legal name, and, and this took me a while to find it. I would like to contact or send notice, like you asked, um, to the chief counsel or general counsel for LexisNexis. So if you had one recorded right now against LexisNexis, I would then serve notice on William Min, the executive vice president and general counsel for LexisNexis and tell him what I just did. I just put a lien on my private property that is in his company's custody and that in which his company is, its business model is relying upon for profit in commerce. So then I have every right to do that. I don't know what they're going to say, but they're not going to like it. All right. So it's the general counsel or chief counsel of the organization. If it's a government agency, it's going to be the director or the secretary of the agency, okay? Like the director of the Department of Motor Vehicles. All right. Now, next one, this is eOscar. Now, eOscar is an acronym, and I'll, I'll get to it in a second here, but it, it's a um it's an acronym for it's a trademark. You can see it's a registered trademark. It's in commerce. This is why I keep saying it's in commerce, right? So this gives you the right to establish a lien over the use of your data because your data is being used in commerce, okay? 
E Oscar <clears throat> is the connection between your company that you're dealing with, your debt collector, your creditor, your bank, and the credit reporting agencies. So E Oscar lets information come from the CRA, okay, to the what they call the furnisher, the information or the data furnisher, okay? So like, let's say it's your bank or your uh, credit card. And so if you have a dispute, if you dispute with either like your bank or the credit bureau, the communication goes through this eOscar system, okay? And it's probably today, it's an, it's an artificial intelligence system. They probably scan a letter in there and the system either validates a letter or something like, it validates an item on your credit, okay? That's what they're doing. So they've, they have like this, super credit reporting agency that's not subject to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. I don't think Oscar is. So Oscar is the trademark of Online Data Exchange, O-L-D-E, L-L-C, okay? So O-L-D-E would be the debtor in your security agreement. You'd probably be really angry if you knew what data they were collecting. Somebody was telling me they had, like on this uh, LexisNexis, they even kept track of consumer purchases this guy made for his home. They even knew what he bought from Home Depot. It's crazy, All right? So then we get into this Eoscar, okay? So old is another one. So these two are big, big ones, All right. So then I went, I did a little more investigation. So I did, I went and I found some data on um, this, you know, Oscar type company um, at uh, Bloomberg. And it, you can tell, I mean, you can buy reports. I, I never buy these reports, but I'm just saying, you can see what's going on with this company, right? So this is its headquarters, right? So what you would do is find out the chief counsel, which I don't think I did here, but you get the idea. So you find the chief counsel and you send, you serve notice on the address. You don't have to do that. I mean, I'm just curious to see what would happen if we do these security agreements and just let them sit there, you know, age for a while, see what happens. Let a few quarters go by and see if their accounting or their insurance uh, organization or their banking affiliation picks up on these liens being there. So I think that's what's going to happen. Um, and then I, I got something else here. Let's see here. Um, let's move this. I, all right. So, yeah. So here's another website that has information about uh, OLDE. And here's your director. No. Yeah. David Vaughn, I guess. Kathy Klimek. I, I don't know who the, who their general counsel is. I mean, you could find it from here. It's probably one of these guys. I'm just saying there's your head office address, et cetera, right? Uh, now, uh, TransUnion is another one. You guys are going to hate them. I mean, I'm going to give you an example. So I was talking with someone who's in, in let's say, the banking industry, that, and he has kind of insider view on this. And he was telling me that TransUnion has this relational database type feature. And it is so powerful that for some reason it's able to track just about anything you can possibly imagine. So, for example, here's the here's the level it goes to. TransUnion. Let's say you're 35 years old. Let's say you're 45 years old right now. TransUnion probably still has information about where you stayed for the six weeks after you graduated college, and you were couch surfing on different friends' apartments because you're looking for a place, right? until you found a place. They probably still have it, even though you didn't, your name wasn't on the utility bill, the rent or anything like that. Somehow, and you weren't getting mail there, somehow they got that data. I'm just saying, it's nasty, the kind of things. We don't even know. We'll probably never know all the things they have. There's probably consumer reports that we'll never even know exist. So that's what I'm saying. On the security agreement, we wanna be as broad as possible as describing the collateral, our identifying information, but also specific. So we're broad, we're general, and then we, di we dial it into a very specific thing to try to catch as much as possible. Uh, but this is another one of the, uh, we call the perpetrators, right? I mean, look at these guys. L let's look at, I'm looking at TransUnion's website, okay? And they have the nerve to call their, this little section here, privacy, okay? When you interact with us, we may collect certain information, such as your email address. Okay, we know that, because I gave it to them, right? But we're also going to do something like this. We're going to collect information about the device you're to, that you're using to access our online service. It, it includes your device ID. It includes your browser. It includes your browser history. What? <laughs> that, might, that might make you sit up and take notice. Um, the pages you view, how long you stay on each page, how often you come back to the page, 
or the site you visit, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is nasty. We collect your IP address, okay? Your connection to the internet, your internet protocol address, your geographical information, what? All this stuff, they're collecting all this. If you call in from Starbucks, they'll know it. You know, anyways, it goes on and on. So, hey, we have the last word. We can use a security agreement. We can take control of this data. I just, that's what I'm, I, I'm eager to do and see, you know, file these things and see what happens. So I, I pretty much finished with it, with the generic version of it. I'm gonna start with a template every time. And it's probably gonna even be modified a bit every time I do one, but hopefully you'll learn how to use it and you can just keep on doing it and show your friends, you know? Uh, Todd, what would you wanna ask? I was, uh, I was wondering how do you, um, how can you, how can you confirm or, sh or show when a company is using your information and then how are you able to uh, label or identify your standing? How much do you sue them for? And do you put all companies on notice? Do you send them a notice saying my biometric uh, information is uh, I have a lien on this information. If you use it, I will sue you for $10 million. Okay, I think we should use it like this. Um, I have a lien on this, you owe me. I have a lien on this and it's worth X. I'm not gonna tell them I'm gonna sue them. I, I don't wanna sue them, but I can, yeah. But I really want them, I want it to show up on their, uh, as a liability on their balance sheet. That's really where I think we're gonna be effective. I think we're gonna really force a policy change with these companies. Okay, so <laughs> we're, just gonna send, we're just gonna send a notice out saying to, to every company that I visit, and these, uh, uh, the TransUnion, all these other guys, and say, this is how much my biometric information is worth. Yeah. You owe me. It's like a bill. You're going to say, it's money. a bill, exactly. It's a claim, and it has to have a dollar amount. Right. Well, we can, we can start coming up with standards, standard ways to assess it. L look at it this way H how, does, how does the government assess how much taxes? You know, it's based on a rate and how much money you got for a tax period. So we're going to do something like that. And what's the standard? I don't know. We have to kind of make it up. Let's see, just see how it plays out. But let's file the liens and see what they do, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, you can foreclose on your rights. We just want we want the ability to foreclose on the rights. So it's going to be interesting. Um, John, did you have something? Hi, Jay. I was wondering if you saw the story about uh, the state of Texas was given information to the ATF in regards to the salaries of people that made gun purchases? And would we be able to do anything to protect ourselves with this kind of, of information? Yeah, definitely. You, you're gonna have some power now. Because now we're not talking about what you just described. We're talking about in order to get done what they did, they had to use your information and you have the superior claim on that information. And now we're gonna talk about that. It's like when I was doing all those foreclosures, when I when I shut the foreclosure down, I did the traditional things, but I also filed a suit against the lawyers and the law firm for ID theft. And the reason why I did it that way is because in order to get out from under that, they had to come up with proof that they had the note. <laughs> I didn't say they didn't have the note. I just said, you stole this guy's ID and you fabricated these records. <laughs> you know, so it changes the game. It changes the way this fight plays out. They're not they're not ready for this. So um, how do we know that, yeah. yeah, how do we know that e Oscar? I mean, you guys never heard of e Oscar, old, these old LLC, you never heard of this probably. I didn't hear about it until like a week ago. So I was trying to do some research for this call, you know? And, and so how do we know? Well, first of all, we can't really communicate with OLDE. We, we don't have standing, we're not members, we're not Equifax, but OLDE, if you look at its website, we can go back there and see. It lists very proudly all the different uh, members. It, it lists TransUnion and all that. Well, hey, I know that I can get my credit file from TransUnion. And if what they're saying is true on the website, well, I know that they're talking to my bank. So of course it has data about me. That's how we know, right? But I could just claim it. I could just say, I think you have data about me. Or if you do, here's my, here's my claim. And I, I think that's going to be not a problem to, to establish that they do. It's not gonna be a problem. So their only way out of it is to sever all ties with you maybe, and to destroy the data that you have a claim on. Now, I think that's gonna be more expensive than not doing that. I'm not sure yet. 
because and, and I'll share this with you all later. I'm not gonna do it right now, but um, there there are uh, industry standards of establishing the certification of the destruction of information. Remember, corporations can only keep documents. I mean, sure, they can keep specimens of things, but typically they're going to keep documents and collections of data, descriptions of data, tables and things like that. Um, if they're going to eliminate or delete some data, they have to follow their own protocol, their data retention policy or their privacy statement, their privacy policy. And there is a certification process that's expensive if they want to get rid of your data. So it's, there's a there's a, this hit of money that they have to spend to sever their uh, liability, if you will. It's going to be really interesting how this plays out. It's, this is going to be really interesting. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to give us a lot of power. I mean, heck, who knows? What if they just ignore us until we we finally have to go? Okay, guys, they're ignoring us after three months or six months. Who's going to sue them now? <laughs> All right, you know, I'll be the first one over there. Um, but yeah, we can do that too. I don't think we're going to have to sue them. I mean, really, I don't think we're going to have to do that. So whoever wants to do it, let me know. Be, I mean, I don't know that I want to publish the actual security agreement, but I, I would just, I'm, I'm giving you enough information that you can you can create your own. If you want me to help you, I'm, I'll be glad to do that. What I will do is I'll start with my version of the security agreement. And then based on what you want to do, like you tell me who you want to put a lien against and let's just do it. And then I will... Um, I will modify some of my the collateral description in your agreement based on what you tell me, right? And then we'll just file it. And then I'll help you with knowing how to file it because we have to go to the county recorder's office where you reside. And also we have to file it with the Secretary of State's office. So we're going to do those two things. And then we're going to, have to find out, you know, the chief counsel's name for the, the debtor, right? So I'll help you out with all that. And then in the process of doing that, I'll probably end up with a database of all this contact information and then I'll make that available. So that way it'll be easier as we move forward. John, do you have an idea? Uh, yeah, I definitely want to do it with you. You can email me anything and sure. I'll, I'll be a guinea pig with you. Um, okay. Also, right. I have four um, adult children, ages 18 to 20, uh, 24 right now. And I'd really like to get them on, on this train before yeah. they start getting everything going. So, you know, we can do it as a group. We could do it as a single, whatever. Good plan. I would do that for my children too. Um, I, 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 you probably heard this story, but um, uh, about oh gosh, it was in 2009 or so. We were at this private school, and there was a there was a, a conflict of some kind. It was a, it was a, the teacher just wasn't trained very well, and so she thought I was abusing my son because the pediatrician told us to give us a treatment for a skin condition my son had. And uh, we were just doing what our pediatrician told us to. And so this teacher thought it was the result of abuse. And she didn't know us that well. But instead of just calling me, of course, their policy is you have to notify the director. The director calls the police. And then they made it even worse. And so anyways, they were threatening me with all kinds of, th all kinds of things. And I, I was just learning about this lean stuff back then. <clears throat> and I went ahead and I told, look, I'm not going to bring my, the other, my other children here so you can evaluate them. It's none of your damn business. And uh, you're not going to get away with this. And so, and I was nervous as heck. I thought they were gonna come and take my children. And I had four children at that time. And uh, so I, I went and created a lien, much like we're talking about. But what I did is I used the birth certificate as collateral and I had someone help me and we, we got that thing filed and I got back a certified copy of it. And I went into the meeting with them when I had everything back, which was like a week later. And I put those liens for all my children on the table. And I just said, which of you thinks you have a superior claim over my children than, not, than I? And they looked at the documents and the one guy, the, the boss, the director, he left. I guess he went to talk to the attorney and he, he came back and he was a different man. He was like really apologetic and said that we, he didn't need to see any of our children anymore and sorry to bother us. And, and so I told him, I said, if you guys can you know, drop this, I'll, I'll, I'll let bygones be got bygones and I won't do anything. And so uh, they did exactly what I asked and um, the school did not, it was still a problem with the school. And so I, uh, I put a, I finished up the lien, I perfected it. And it was a $28 million lien against the school and it's the, the, the opera, the people in the school. And I wasn't trying to destroy the school, but as it turned out, it took about a year and a half. And then the school actually had to leave the state of Florida. It had two locations because that lien disrupted its ability to do anything financially. It couldn't even get insurance. So I, this, these are very powerful. But remember, liens are statutory. All liens are statutory. So you have you can't just slap liens on people. You got to have some backing behind it. You know.
Todd, do you have experience like that, Todd? Well, I, I just, John, that was brilliant. I think I told yeah. you that, you know, you got this transgender nonsense going on in the schools. <laughs> right. And I just wrote a 16 page criminal complaint, sent it to the sheriff, the FBI and uh, the Congressional um, Oversight Committee and, uh, because of, of the of the property rights that the, yeah. they're violated. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, there was, uh, you know, you look up statues practicing medicine without a license and all this other stuff. But what you just did is brilliant. I mean, I don't know. I just put a claim. Copy. Yeah, I, it just stopped everything. If you have copies of that, I would love to share that because there's going to be a big meeting coming up. Yeah, um, I've already share, shared the criminal complaints with the parents and so on and so forth. But I think what, you, what you're talking about will turn this nonsense around. Yeah, I think we're going to have a lot of power. It's going. Yeah, we're going to be the ones to make the rules from now on. But uh, yeah, if I could just describe this transgender thing, just to give you guys some language, you can think of it how you want, but I have no problem with those people. It's just that I don't, I'm not required to participate in what I would call a mental illness. And so there's really no such thing as transgender. You know, there are only two genders. You can, you can say that all you want, but a person who insists on behaving that way is probably suffering from a mental illness. And um, it, it would be under probably the category of a range of paraphilic disorders. If you want to look that up, you'll see that. So there, it's not transgender. It's just that someone who's self suffering from one or more paraphilic disorders who really needs mental a mental evaluation or some sort of psychiatric care. And um, what's happening is that the political world is trying to get us to participate in their uh, mental illness, and we're not required to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's like they opened up the psych ward, and and now we have to participate, and we don't. I mean, we have a psych ward for people to we can isolate them from society. Not to be cruel, we're trying to treat them. Hopefully, you know. So it's not that I, I don't I don't like them. Uh, it's kind of annoying, but I, I see that these are people that need care. Well, John, it's it's worse it's worse than that. First of all, they haven't done an individualized assessment, so you don't know if yeah. it's transgender that, yeah. dysphoria, yeah. and you there don't know that. if it's dis dis disassociative disorder or schizophrenia or delusional. And now they're also mistreating them. Because the worst thing you can do with somebody with a mental disorder, and this is a mental disorder, yes. is to appease them. It makes yes. it worse. Yes. Now, on top of that, this is this is diagnosed as a social and a psychological contagion. It's very similar to bulimia. And contagion, huh? Anorexia. Wow. Yes. I never yes. heard of that before. Okay. Yes, it's a psychological contagion. So whenever okay. you have general ed parents that their children are going into the to the classes and they're associating with these other individuals that may or may not have tr uh, transgender dysphoria or disorder whatever it is it actually spreads that's crazy and, well people want to behave that way to be accepted maybe well that's and that's that's another issue is that now i mean rem remember i was a, i was a teacher and i can tell you from experience this one kid brian came into class and you know, Brian was Brian and he was just like any other kid. And then all of a sudden he changed to Brianna and everybody was giving him all this attention. And that was another reason why these kids right. are doing it because they're crazy. Right. You might have to try that. that. Yeah. I've so heard that before. The, yeah. other, the other thing is that parents don't understand that according to IDEA law, which is a branch off of ADA law, this is a, since this is a mental disability and it is a disorder, they have to inform the parents. There's no way going around it. It is a violation of I idea law. And, and yeah. I have been talking to parents forever about the laws that they've been violating. It's also child abuse and child abuse. It is, of course it is, because yeah. It, the FDA hasn't even, ha has not even uh, supported the hormone treatments. It's not even FDA well, approved. We have another problem, which is the, the parents' patria, which is the, 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 court, the state is considered you to have abandoned your children when you take them to school. So there's that aspect of it. You're culpable. So we really have to wake up. You know, it's, it's, gonna, it's a hard, it's a hard solution. But, but, uh, you know, going back to this, you know, controlling our data, look at all the different ways we can address this, right? You see, you see how powerful this is. So, um, yeah, so, so I would just, you know, Put together, you know, the collateral description. You can use my example, and maybe I'll do some of a, a tutorial in the coming weeks 
explaining. I just don't, my, my, I'm just concerned about giving you guys a document and then you run with it. And then not to say that you're going to mess it up, but it just finds its way into groups of people and the groups of people don't think it's good enough. And they start adding a bunch of garbage to it and then it doesn't work anymore. And then what are we doing? Right. I, I don't want to help the tax protest movement out. I just want to accomplish a certain thing. We have privacy, we have privacy rights, we have property rights, and I want to give you guys the, the means of, of clawing them back. That's it. We don't, you know, and this this currency, all right, that's gonna, well, it's already working its way into using our biometric data. I mean, how many of you use your your eye or your palm or your thumbprint to access your phone or your computer? I wouldn't recommend that. We're, what's going on with that data? You know, and I'm watching uh, shows like this, uh, this one TV show. I, I don't know if it's still in production. It's called Castle. It's um, a murder type police type story. It's a bit of a comedy, but uh, there and many of these other shows. Uh, Shark is another one, I think. And when they're showing the police doing an investigation, they always go right to the keyboard. It's not, you know, going out into the world and, 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 and investigating anything. They go right to the keyboard and they start downloading. This is what they show in the TV sh series. They start downloading video feeds from all over town. Right. And they're showing. And so it's normal now. It's acceptable. You're you can be observed as you're walking down the sidewalk. And once you're out of range in one camera, you're in range in another camera. Oh, and let's just grab your facial image and map it against something that we didn't even talk about in the TV series, because we're not going to talk about that part of it. We're not going to explain how we can verify your identity just by getting your face, your image in public. They're not telling people yet that people don't think about this. If I get your image in, in public, what good is that unless I can verify it against something? Hmm, what would that be? Oh, your driver's license. <laughs> who's who's bridging all this, you know, data together? That's but I think right now is where we have it, we have a chance. We still have a chance, I think, to have some control over this. What do you think, Ray? I think it's it's cool. Hey, okay, so <laughs> now <laughs> thinking yeah. about what you're saying, it really made me realize yeah. uh, NCIC. Right. Oh, yeah. NCIC database, because that's a bridge. Because the yeah. NCIC is for getting all this information is provided by the FBI, federal, state, local, foreign, you know, criminals. Yeah. And and anytime you're pulled over, can you imagine if you have a security agreement recorded for intellectual property? Because every time the police pull you over, they're, they're, they're running on the NCIC database. Those yeah. You're talking they're about. using that data. And so you can build that municipality. Yeah. It, it owes you. And you can put that term in your agreement. Any accessing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, sure. That's what the cameras do, too. They're all going to the NCIC yes. database. Yeah. And your your cameras that, you know, I hate sitting at the stoplight and the dang camera's like looking right at me. I just hate that. I I, I mean, what, I don't know what they're going to do with it, but but what do you do? I mean, you just. They have to have an identification process, which is what you're talking about, because it's going to show up on their uh, bonding and insurance. Sure. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I mean. That might be the first thing. I mean, maybe this will, maybe this alone might just uh, get rid of the the surveillance on the streets, and that doesn't inhibit the police from doing their jobs. Just do your damn job. You don't get to sit behind your desk with a keyboard. We're paying you to get out there and do your job. You don't get to do surveillance on everybody because there might be some criminals in our neighborhood, and that's their, you know, justification. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is this will throw a wrench in the gears on the surveillance state that started yeah. already and wanting to intensify. Yeah, yeah. we're gonna this is gonna be fun. We're gonna have some control here. So, what would you want to say, Stray? Um, oh, well, two things. So, like for the cameras in yeah. uh, New Mexico, they say, "Oh, they're not turned on." I'm like, "Yeah," because you guys never lie. Um, you know, that setup <laughs> is like at least seventy thousand dollars. It's probably one hundred fifty thousand dollars for that. Yeah, setup. you're just not going to use a great opportunity. Yeah, like so you're going to get away with that with public funds, right? Right, right. But um, <laughs> for the driver's ID thing, um, I know I don't think you use yours anymore. But besides using the lean as um, as a resource of kind of trying to keep your your data and whatnot, but like, do you think it'd be better to also move away from use like renewing your driver's license? No, uh, I think you should keep that in good standing and keep using it. For years, I was opposed to that. But after a while, I realized, you know, gov that's probably the, one of the best things government does is the is the motor vehicle. Now, I don't I don't the maps, the, the streets, the maintenance of it, the traffic rules. I mean, of, of, of all the wasteful things government does, those traffic rules are perfect. They're so logical. 
you know, it's like a computer program. I, I hate to say it, but it's, it's one of the best things. So at the same time, I, I still disagree with the, the manner in which the easement rights are being abused. And we could talk about that too, but also the fact that you're being charged a tax for the private use of a public right of way. Uh, and that I don't believe is legally enforceable. However, the police are just going to keep harassing you until you until you participate. But I think in the it's for the greater good. I think really that overall the system is is what we need. We need a way to regulate the use of the highways. I mean, look at the idiots around today. I mean, they they're not even watching the road. Whenever I see, I'm I'm by UCF. It's a university. I, and whenever I see a wreck, it's not two cars. It's four. It's four or five. Because some idiot's texting and he slams into the next guy, the next guy, and there's they're all texting. Yeah. Yeah. So so no, I, I wouldn't want to shut down that system, but I would I would want to put a lien on it and I would want to have a bit of control over it. I wouldn't want to shut it down, you know. Well, not so, shut down the motor vehicles, but like just your ID, like try and yeah. get rid of the picture kind of thing, you know. And that would be interesting. My friend did that. Um and he was my partner when I when I first started learning this stuff in the 90s. And he had to remove his, his photo. And, and he used to use the right to privacy to win traffic cases. I don't know how he did it, but I didn't learn that aspect of it. I was doing it. I was doing other things. Um, but um, that was his area. And, and so he would use the right to privacy. Uh, and But he did get a driver's license in Arizona without his photo on there, which I yeah. think you could still do today. You can? Okay. Wait, I think so. I, I, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, in the, in the early days, in the 90s, I took on that case of driving without a license and registration, and I won that case. And then I realized after I won it, that was uh, interesting, but totally useless. Mm. It's totally useless. I mean, that sends the message to all the people that would be irresponsible, that now they can be irresponsible and not be accountable. And so I immediately, within the week, I went and reinstated my license because that's how I won the case. But ironically, I had my license canceled. But then I reinstated it, and, 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 and I've had it ever since. You know, but... Um, we, we, we have to be more responsible as people. That's a, that's a different subject for easement rights. I love that subject too, but th let's get this lean stuff in place. I'm going to start doing it. I'm going to share with you what I'm doing. John, what did you want to say? I just want to let you know that I haul the Amish uh, part-time for them and uh, get them to their job sites and stuff. And they actually have an Ohio driver's license or Ohio ID with no photo on it. And they yeah. did it for religious implications. Um, sure. So they 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 obtain state IDs with just their name on it. So we know the software can handle it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I don't know how my partner did that. I think it was on the right to privacy. I didn't even ask him. Um, interesting. All right, that's good to note that. Um, well, so we have. Uh, let's see. I don't want to miss anybody. Stray, did you want to say anything? No, that's okay. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking they make it like celebratory, you know, I was just thinking about it that, oh, you get to get your picture taken for your driver's license, all that's I know. So cool. And I'm like, wow. And then they, <laughs> they want to talk about it if it's, if it looks good and all this nonsense. Yeah. And here's a, you know, here's a lollipop after uh, And after you get your vaccines, here's a lollipop. Oh you know? gosh. Yeah. Right. It's Don't just, die. <laughs> here's, yeah. a, here's a lollipop. Uh, commerce versus personal auto. What, what did you want to ask on that one, Elizabeth? Commerce. If your image is used in commerce, yeah, and it is used in commerce. I mean, what's the point of collecting it, right? Did you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, Todd, if you if you wanted to, I mean, I'm I'm happy to address that. It's a little off topic, but yeah, what did you want to ask? Well, um, I just thought I'd let you know. I you know I sent that affidavit of facts to yeah. those uh, those individuals. And they canceled the mask policy within a week. Oh, okay. Maybe they were maybe they realized you actually could spell words on a piece of paper and they got scared. <laughs> but uh, if you already have a cause of action, I mean, it's up to you. If you have a cause of action, you can file it. But yeah, I do. I, I want to go forward. I want to make an okay. example of them. But here's, I agree. The, other, here's yeah. the other thing I wanted to tell you. So my wife ended up going to another doctor and the doctor said she never needed the surgery. I, can I add malpractice to that? If you get a second opinion. And I can tell you in Florida that in order to sue a doctor, you need a doctor's opinion. That is, it was a doctor. She went to see a second doctor and he told her she didn't even need the hip surgery. Yeah. So, yeah, you may have a case for that. It's a little bit outside of my area, but okay. possibly. I don't, I don't know what the criteria are offhand. Yeah, but uh, uh, Mocha, I agree with you. I mean, it, there is, uh, there are uh, disguises and strategies you can use um, 
makeup and things, uh, prosthetic devices you can put on your face. The key there is asymmetry. You create asymmetry on your face and that obstructs and, and defeats the surveillance grid for facial recognition. But where they do have us, which is worse than facial is voice, believe it or not. Voice. But yeah, I'm with you on that one. I like the fake nose and all that. Keep in mind that the, the light that's being collected from in the, in the image is actually coming from your skeleton. It's going through your skin. It's not x-rays, but it's like more like infrared. So the heat pattern from your body is being collected. Uh, it's not the actual surface of your skin. So like if you if you're a guy and you and you and you grow a beard, it doesn't change anything. You still look the same to the camera. Now what would really defeat everything instead of the fake nose might do it, the wig probably won't do it, but it has to be asymmetrical. But what will do it is if like for example on your pair of glasses and you can buy these right now. Um, they're just about to go into production. They've been in they've been in development for about ten or twelve years right now from this uh, Japanese physicist. But you put an LED right here. OK, on anything you want to wear, like glasses like this, and this will blind whatever camera is on your face. They will not know who that is, no matter what. So uh, we, that's another subject we can cover, too. But again, I kind of want them to collect my data, right? I mean, if you know that you can put a lien on it and it has monetary value, heck, yeah, go right ahead. That's our licensing agreement. I'm allowing you to collect it and you're going to pay me. Uh, so if there's a notice of lien, I'm going to have to read this one. If there's a notice of lien on a court record, and okay, so notice of lien, let's use the IRS as an example. If the IRS files a notice of lien in the county records, that's not the lien. What, what they're saying is that there is a lien somewhere, it's in the IRS records, and that they're just giving notice of the same. And that's legal, legally binding. It's enough to prioritize the lien rights of the government, and it's enough to encumber a uh, property of record that you may sell. That's the point of the notice of lien. So let's say no, no, it doesn't appear on your credit. Yeah, well, okay, your credit report is not gonna have a record of lien. That is not where the lien is held. The lien is held with a custodian of the records at the IRS, wherever that is, I don't know. And you're gonna be very, it's very difficult to get unless the IRS sues you. I mean, you might be able to get something for, through a FOIA request, but, the actual lien records, I, I'll tell you right now, okay, here's the truth. The IRS does not have lien records. <laughs> I guess you already knew that. The, the Department of Justice will tell you, will lie and say, oh yeah, the lien record is this and they'll make up some document or they'll say it's the substitute for return or they'll say it's your tax return or they'll just make up something. But there is no, there is no assessment, okay? There is no, there is no lien. There is no, <clears throat> put it this way, whatever records the IRS may have about you, there's a 99.99% chance that it has no foundation. There's no, there's nothing behind it. There's no substance behind it. So this is where we get into this notice of lien. It's taken at face value, right? So you can remove the item from your credit file, but the, but the notice of lien is still going to be there and it's still going to encumber it. So the, the way to get the notice of lien off your county records is to get the IRS to remove it. And you can actually ask the IRS to remove it. And there are certain criteria under which it will do that. And in some rare cases, I've done that. Um, most of the time, not. But I can easily get it off the, uh, the credit report, easily. No problem there. Yeah. What's, what's no way, Stray? The, uh, the glasses that you brought up, that like the LED. Yeah. Yeah, did you find them on the internet? That's no, easy. I'm trying to find, what are they called? Is it just LED? I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, LED glasses, uh, uh, surveillance technology. Look for the word Japanese scientist. Japanese. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> he's been around for a long time. Yeah, you'll find it. That's why I didn't even give you anything specific. It's so easy to find it. But you're okay. going to find many other uh, methods copying this guy. But really the LED right there. And yeah. he, had a, he had a series of, but now... His glasses are way more sophisticated looking. They're really slick. They're kind of stylish. Uh, and they look just like mine do right now. You can't see the light. But if, if there's a photograph, all you see is like, you know, it looks like the sun. The heat. And, and do you think that those, um, those like clothing or sweatshirts that were made that kind of people on them would mess with it too? Or is it just heat? Yeah, the clothing helps. But really you want something for the face. 
Okay. You want you want an asymmetrical type of arrangement. Like you can have something that goes like a wig, but it'll like say that covers your eye, right? Or it puts a, a dark color here, but not here. Mm. There are certain patterns that work better than others. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to play that system. You know, you know me, I'm like, ah, it's why I'm gonna waste my time with these idiots. I would rather mm -hmm. just put a lean on there and then just hang on to it. Yeah. My my children can inherit the lean, by the way. <laughs> I mean they can. So isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So well, yeah, I, I, I yeah. go ahead. There's been people talking about cases where because of the voice recognition and recording of like AI that people are trying to like supposedly hold their children hostage until they pay a certain amount of money. Um, and they like have their voice recording in the background and, you know, like the grandmother calls the grandchild and says, oh my gosh, I could have sworn I just heard you and was talking to you. Like, where are you? Are you okay? And they're like, yeah, oh. I'm fine. have you seen those? Wow, no, People I haven't coming heard up that with one. Code Gosh, because wow, they'll have like, uh, you know, the grandchild saying something, you know, crying or, um, grandma, but like, please just pay them or something like that, or I'm okay, right. and it right. sounds just like their grandchildren or their family members. Yeah, we can use um, AI to do that now. Yeah, and so people are coming up with code words. I guess there's really no way around that, but. Yeah, it's 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 getting interesting, but yeah, the IRS. I mean, as far as assessments go, the, it does no assessment. There is no assessment certificate. They just expect everyone to file a tax return, and if you don't, they'll file a fake one for you and call that the assessment, and it's not. So the only way you're going to beat them though is in court. You can have a chance to beat them in court, and and yeah, you can do a FOIA request. Um, what you you might you may get to find out what your actual actual taxable activity is. Because I know a lot of you don't realize that I don't say this too much, but there is no such thing as an income tax. Even the IRS knows this. I mean, the income itself is not, I think gross income is defined in the tax code, but income is not. The word income is not defined in the tax code. It's defined by the district courts. This is how they play the system. So you can have income. That doesn't necessarily mean it's taxable. If you report it as being taxable, then it is. They're not going to argue with you, but there's a chance that it's not. and if you if it is, it's going to be taxable for something you're doing that is a licensed activity under Title 27 of the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, for alcohol, tobacco products, and firearms. And um, I can just tell you, it's been a rare time that I've been able to use that understanding to defeat somebody a claim against my client. And as it turns out, it was my first my first client that I was ever assigned, and that was back in 1994. It was an IRS case. And I've had to fly to Missouri to do this case and nothing worked. I, I didn't, I couldn't uh, stop the IRS. They were taking this guy's farm. Okay. They were taking everything. And I did a FOIA request, you know, I'm dealing with the IRS over here. And so I did a FOIA request over there and I got the individual master file and I decoded it using the IRS's manual. Um, I think they have it online right now. It's called the 6209 manual or something like that. But anyways, this farmer, he was a flower farmer, and he he had a seasonal farm and where he produced flowers for the Macy's Day Parade. That was his career for like 40 years. <laughs> and um, he was being taxed for manufacturing pistols and revolvers. So the remedy on that, and they, they had already taken his property, right? They towed the cars away. They, they were seizing the house. They were going to sell it. And this guy was, he was in bad condition. He was in bad shape. So I, the remedy is in the tax code, the remedy for this situation is to uh, file a report to the FBI. So I did, I sent him a letter and I said, they're taxing him for this, making guns and he's a flower farmer. And I didn't hear anything back, but a month later, my fax machine lit up and uh, he was sending me all the releases of lean, release of levy, release of lean, release of levy, release of lean. <laughs> and that's the last I ever heard of it. It was done. I mean, they gave all his property back, but of course, you know, nothing happened to the IRS agents, but that just confirmed my suspicion that the whole thing's a scam. Now, I'm not saying you could use that method in your case, but still, that's what's going on. And, and that's another thing. I mean, what, what, what the heck can we do with our, what information does the IRS have about us? What, what information does the FBI have about us? I mean, now probably if you go to protest, they, they probably get your face, right? and compare it to your uh, driver's license. Yeah, the, the lien I did for my children, that's gonna be a little bit different. That was a long process. Um, I, I'm not gonna, 
I'm, I don't want to publish that. It's already on the public record. I, I don't even know where I have it in my computer. Um, it's probably archived somewhere. But, but but what I I mean, if somebody wants help with that, I can probably work with you on doing that and recreating it. I don't have a problem with that. And and I think I can even do a better job now that I know a little bit more. Um, but I would really look forward to working, putting a lean on these uh, this biometric data. I think this is gonna this is gonna do a lot for us. Um, yeah. So, right. Yeah, we're all suspects, right? Hey, all... hey, John. I have a I have a comment. Yeah. <clears throat> can I? Okay. Yeah. You know, I was just thinking when you just said about um, you know, the the recognition and you know, all they really need is your name. I mean, if you think about it, um, you yeah. know, they could just they could trace your name they could find out what what you've done on your bank records they could trace that and have, have you flown on mm -hmm. an airplane um the phones already record your voice and start spinning back yep. marketing ads to you i mean they're already doing all of that yep. i mean and as far as the three-letter agencies i was at the j6 and i came back and about a week and a half later i got a call and but yeah wow well, that was because, well, they were saying they were, they were tracing everybody's, uh, anybody that took a flight yeah. to that area was a suspect. But I found out that actually it was someone had written a, a poison pen letter on me and, Ooh. and contacted the FBI. So he was like, Hey, look, oh. I have completely checked you out. I've looked at your he left me a message and he said you're not going to believe me i know there's a lot of scam things but you can trace this number you can check this number out and google it you know it i am with this three-letter agency and so i did and i was like son of a gun wow. <laughs> he is so i called him back within minutes but okay. he said you know I, I i've looked at your your facebook i know that you're a good person <laughs> but have you ever heard what a poison pen letter is and i said yeah uh, he goes, i said well who was oh well I, it's anonymous I can't okay. tell you who it, I said, well, that's so, great. He knows my name, but, but I can't know his, right? Yeah. So, right. And so, um, not fair. he said, right. So he said, you know, basically they said that you were going to take, do, do you still own that, that nine millimeter Glock? And I was like, yeah. You should have said what Glock? <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is a Glock? Oh yeah. I know, never, right? Never I know, right? Himself. And he goes, yeah, yeah. good, good, good answer. Right. He said, you know, and he said, right. well, this this basically this this pen letter said that you were going to go back with firearms in march 15th or something like that and cause all kinds of trouble back then he goes but we're already past that date by a few days and you're home so i know you're good and hey listen i'm really embarrassed that i have to call you about this but you know wow. this kind of shit you know stuff happens did you meet anybody back there did you talk to anybody i said no so there are people that are just literally looking and, you know, it doesn't even have to be an AI necessarily. I mean, you could have right. just people that have, you know, bad ideas. Right. And well, if they, somebody calls you like that, make sure you call them back. Make sure you, it's, the, it's the person who says he is, right? Well, I did, and, yeah. And I wouldn't even discuss things with him. I mean, yeah, you got lucky there and he was just honestly trying to end the case, you know, so... Yeah, I know. That's right. He did. He said, I said, so now am I like blacklisted or anything? He goes, no. Yeah, he goes, yeah. everything's cool. It's totally wrapped up. Everything's fine. And, you know, afterwards, I was like, you know, I don't really give a shit. Okay. You know, they can do whatever they want. I mean, you know, it's like, what are they going to do? I, mean, I am such a harmless person. It's sort well, of like, like. This this prompts me to tell you this. So you've been hearing these stories about the banks closing people's accounts and giving people a hard time. This, this is in the yeah. news. Okay. So pick your favorite politician and write a letter, anonymous letter, or make up a name, it doesn't matter, to a series of the major banks. Just guess. And and just tell on this person. And just, you can make up anything. Mm -hmm. that, that he's involved in, you know, uh, money laundering or bribes or something like that. He's using, oh, yeah. he's bragging about his ability to use cryptos in the banking system because he has an insider buddy or something, right? Think like this, right? If right. you uh, like pick somebody, probably not, you probably wouldn't work for Biden because he probably didn't have a bank account, but but do something like that, right? And they'd be mm -hmm. close to their house left and right. If they mm -hmm. want to come on us and they're behind all this, they're behind harassing us and frustrating us so we'll accept whatever they want. If we did that to them on a regular basis, make it your new hobby. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Like an AOC type character on the news. Hit a barrage of seven or eight banks with a letter like that. There you go. Yeah, they'll just start closing accounts. Just an idea. <laughs> so, all right, yeah. So, as far as uh, doing this uh, lean thing, all right. So, I have an order form. It should be at Ace of Coins either tonight or tomorrow. Um, my thinking is, if because I'm probably going to uh, bring in people to help me do this, I'm probably going to charge five hundred dollars each each for each one. Now, my thinking is. If I do that, I would love to do it all day long, right? But I would rather just show you one and have you be comfortable using that whole method of discovering your county recorder's address. It's it's procedure for filing the lien, preparing the lien, describing the collateral better, you know, than the template, and then uh, finding the uh, general counsel for all these companies, and then finding out how to file this with the Secretary of State's office for your state, right? Those are not very complicated, but they're unusual. So once I help you through that, doing that. You should be able to do the next one yourself and also do it for your family. So I figured the $500 is almost like free, you know, I mean, and, and it justifies my time. And if I, if I get many of these, I'll be able to hire people and pay them to, to help you guys. So that way, cause it's hard to get me on the phone, as you know. So, but anyways, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. I mean, if you guys want to, you know, get a team, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to show a group of people how to do that. I'm just, I just, you know, Maybe I'll be slow on actually doing that, but if you have a you have your own special group of people that you're going to keep it private, I'll show the group. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate your questions and comments, um, and look forward to working with y'all on this. And uh, let me know if there's something in particular you want me to cover. But I'm going to continue on talking about this. Now, last week, I just want to mention this last thing. I just think it's it's it could be quite useful if you if you see the situation you know for what it is i really like the idea of writing a post nuptial agreement all right in a marriage this is not okay the way it's used right now is to it's the staging process for a separation or a divorce it's a way to get to a, a divorce decree now if that is going to happen it's a great idea to do something like that if you can if you can if you can get an agreement with your spouse on as many things as possible before the thing proceeds. If you're going to do that, I hope you don't have to do that. But my point is that everyone should have this post-nuptial agreement because it's after the marriage. Of course, it's an agreement, but it's post-nuptial. Okay, it can also be pre-nuptial. That's even better. But the post-nuptial does a couple of things, and and I, I'll just summarize it from last week. Basically, you're 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 creating a trust in the agreement, and you're you're assigning all the chattel property you have in your household, let's just say, to keep things simple, to the trust. So now there's nothing to talk about in the marriage as far as like, th there's no reason why a court would come in there and have to do anything because there's no property. Okay. So that's one example. The second one is a dispute resolution clause that's, that requires, it's compulsory, it requires binding mediation, or I'm sorry, binding, let's call it arbitration. And as much as I don't like those, my purpose in incorporating that into a postnuptial agreement is to actually preclude the court from interfering in the agreement. All right, so just keep that in mind. I'm not trying to show you guys how to divorce yourselves. I'm just saying, I think this is a way to retain our parental rights, exercise our parental rights, and keep the courts out of our business. Okay, now the way this can be defeated, of course, is by one of the spouses wanting to have power over the other one, which is, happens a lot, and going around that agreement or trying to assist the court in, in breaching that agreement, okay? It, it would be hard to do that, but I'm just saying, uh, if you guys want me to talk more about that, I can do it. If you have a specific scenario, uh, we can talk about that, Set, you know, schedule a time with me, all right? So I just want to mention that in, in, in passing. Thanks again, and I uh, hope you all enjoy your weekend. All right, talk to you next week. Take care.